topic, does it still exist? Um, 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 I have conflicts of interest, but they do not bear any relevance uh, to, to this talk. Um, uh, I, I work in, in uh, university hospitals in Leuven. Uh, as I said, I'm an anesthesiologist and I work in this 1800-bed uh, hospital. Uh, with approximately 50 ORs and we perform 60,000 anesthetics per year. I'm an obstetric anesthetist and we do a lot of um, uh, deliveries uh, with a high epidural rate in the labor and delivery ward. Um, um, this is um, our uh, operating theater, um, old and new buildings. Um, and where you see the arrow, there is the new labor and delivery ward. Uh, what I will be discussing is um, the incidence pathophysiology prevention and treatment of postural puncture headache. Um, the long-term effects of postural puncture headache is also something I will be discussing um, because I think it's, it's also very important for non-anesthetists as well. Um, and, and I will go over these aspects during my lecture. Um, of course, some are focused on anesthesia, and I know that the majority of you are non-anesthesiologists, but I do think they bear relevance to neurologists, neurosurgeons, uh, etc. as well. Let's look at the clinical features and the differential diagnosis of post puncture headache first. Um, well, as you know, usually with post puncture headache, there is a history of a procedure involving the uh, cerebrospinal fluid and the dura mater. Um, the headache that develops is usually quite severe, located in the frontal and occipital areas, is associated with neck stiffness and pain in the neck, and typically ex it exacerbates when the patient is standing. Um, th there are some associated symptoms like photophobia, nausea, neck stiffness, tinnitus, diplopia, uh, and sometimes even low back pain. Uh, usually it occurs two to five days after the procedure has been performed, could be a lumbar puncture, could be an epidural or spinal procedure. And it, in the majority of cases, <coughs> excuse me, is self-limiting to approximately seven days. <coughs> but in some patients, it can be prolonged and give still symptoms weeks after the initial diagnosis. There are a number of uh, differential diagnoses that you can um, discuss, uh, including spontaneous CSF leak uh, or CSF leak as a result of a trauma. Um, anyway, there, you need to look into these differential diagnoses. There is no real diagnostic tool, not even an MRI is uh, completely 100% reliable. Um, what is the pathophysiology of the problem? Well, if you make a hole in the dura, there is CSF leakage, uh, and as a result, CSF hypovolemia, which uh, is the case when you have lost approximately 10% or more of your CSF. Uh, as a result of the low CSF volume, uh, when the patient moves into the upright position, the CSF moves into the spinal sac, and the brain moves and loses cushion, and this results in downward uh, tension on the meninges, nerves, and vessels. And uh, there is some evidence that this, this is the pathophysiological mechanism because you see, have radiological evidence of that, and you have the cranial nerve pulses, which can result of the, the, the sagging of the pons against bone. There are, however, other mechanisms possible you know better than me that brain volume needs to be constant in the skull. So when there is CSF lost, it must be replaced. And this can be done by vasodilation and an increase in intracranial blood volume. And the arterial and venous vasodilation causes the posterior puncture headache. And there is evidence that this is the mechanism because if you have an adenosine receptor blocking effect, uh, as, a, as with caffeine, you might have a, an improvement uh, by reducing uh, vasodilation. What are the risk factors? Well, it is not a problem usually in elderly patients. It is most of the time a problem in young adults, 20, 30, 40 years old. Women are more prone to the problem than men. 
And when you had a prior posterior puncture headache after lumbar puncture or after a spinal, the chance that you will develop a new posterior puncture headache whenever you have a new procedure is three times higher than in patients that did not have a previous uh, posterior puncture headache. Um, women or men with chronic headache problems also have a high risk of posterior puncture headache and there is some not very conclusive, but some evidence that when you're obese, you are protected against the development of posterior puncture headache. It is quite unclear whether young children uh, have the problem as well, but most likely, yes. Uh, so there are some uh, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors um, that you can uh, ascertain. There are some modifiable risk factors. The size of the needle you are using to perforate the dura is important. And I see many neurologists perform lumbar punctures with 22 gauge needles. This, of course, carries a high risk. Needle shape is important, non-cutting versus cutting needles, orientation of the needle, style letter placement, and operator experience. Indeed, um, so this is a, a study, an example of uh, women with a previous posterior puncture headache history have a higher chance of developing a new problem. And this is needle size, 22 gauge needles, higher incidence of posterior puncture headache versus the 26, 27, 28, 29 gauge needles. Also non-cutting versus cutting, Whitaker versus Quinke, Sproto versus Quinke, much higher risk with the Quinke needles. And if you reinsert the stylet uh, of your spinal needle or your epidural needle, you will reduce the incidence of postural puncture headache. This is the, the size of the hole uh, uh, and the damage and also the size of the, of the needles and the incidence after the spinal anesthetic, um, the incidence of postural puncture headache. And you can see that if we as anesthetists for our spinal anesthetics use 27 gauge needles, the risk of a posterior puncture headache with a non-cutting needle is one to 2%. With a um, 24 gauge or 22 gauge with thicker needles, it, it goes up to five to 10% uh, if you do a lumbar puncture, for instance, with those needles. Reinserting the stylet is important before you remove the spinal needle from the dura. It is important to reinsert the stylet because then you can't redraw tissue into the spinal needle and make the hole even worse. Um, of course, experience as a, a, an anesthetist or a person performing lumbar punctures is also important. Having done more than 50 to 100 procedures reduces dramatically the incidence of posterior puncture headache. And also the TUI needle, which we use for epidural um, uh, punctures, is important how larger the epidural needle, 16 gauge, for instance, has a higher incidence of posterior puncture headache versus uh, the 18 gauge needles where the incidence of dural puncture and posterior puncture headache is reduced. What can we do to prevent posterior puncture headache? Well, first of all, we need to know how, when you're an anesthetist and you're performing epidurals, uh, for, for labor analgesia or for surgical interventions, you need to know what is the normal rate of an accidental dural puncture with your epidural needle. Well, that should be around 1% or lower. If you have 2, 3, 4%, something is wrong with your technique. Um, we also know that when you're performing epidurals, you need to use saline as your loss of resistance medium versus air. Now, this is perhaps not as that important for neurosurgeons and neurologists to know, but it is uh, the medium you're using for your epidural is also important. Um, performing CSEs, uh, performing uh, with, with uh, saline, it gives you a reduced incidence. CSEs, so the combination of spinal and epidural anesthesia, no difference in the risk of accidental dural puncture and post dural puncture headache. <coughs> Some say that if you put the patient in the sitting position, you have a higher chance of accidental dural puncture and of uh, post dural puncture headache, but this is not demonstrated by literature. Uh, so if you perform as a neurologist your lumbar punctures for diagnostic purposes, you can 
is easily do that in the sitting position uh, and you don't have to do it in the left lateral tilt position, left lateral position, for instance. Um, also, it is an, uh, a, a, a non-issue that after you perform the lumbar puncture, a spinal anesthetic or an epidural, patients should remain in their bed for 24 hours. That is completely not important. Bed rest and hydration doesn't prevent posterior puncture headache to occur. Um, so these are all, uh, well, not that important factors to, to produce. When we as anesthesiologists perform an, an epidural and we have an accidental dural tap, so we make the hole in the dura with our large two-way epidural needle, the, the risk of posterior puncture headache is quite high. Uh, and we try to reduce it by doing some preventive prophylactic measures to, to avoid posterior puncture headache to occur. Um, some have used concentropin as their uh, strategy. Uh, there is one well-performed study with a positive effect, but it's only one study, and cosintropin with HEPH has uh, some uh, serious side effects as well. The use of epidural morphine, one positive study, very small study, uh, high dose of morphine causing nausea and vomiting, um, and no confirmation of this positive effect of this study has ever been published. The two things that might work is prolonged intrathecal catheters or a prophylactic epidural blood patch. Uh, what about using intrathecal catheters after an accidental dural puncture with your TUI epidural needle? And, and this is an, uh, an overview we published uh, a year ago in uh, anesthesia uh, with, with the number of experts. Well, what we do is we have Give, done an accidental dural puncture, and the catheter that usually goes epidurally, we insert intrathecally through the hole that we made accidentally. Uh, the catheter remains intrathecally for 24 hours. We give some saline through it, and the idea is that because of a small inflammatory reaction around the catheter, the dura hole will be closed once you've removed the catheter. And because we give an infusion of saline, we replace the lost CSF and there will be less symptoms. Um, also, when you have an intrathecal catheter and you need to use it for anesthesia or analgesia to work quickly, uh, and you can't do another accidental dural puncture when you do a new epidural anesthetic. Um, there is some evidence that it works, but the initial uh, um, meta-analysis of whether an intrathecal catheter worked was that there was no effect. However, uh, once there was a little bit more evidence um, brought together, uh, there is indeed a positive effect on uh, posterior puncture headache uh, and less need for blood patching with intrathecal catheters. And this is our own study, which we published some five, six years ago, um, where we uh, evaluated 130 patients with an accidental dural puncture. Some of them had a catheter recited epidurally, and some had an intrathecal catheter uh, performed. And what you can see is that there was a reduced incidence of postural puncture headache from 62 to 42%. Which, uh, and, and less need for, for um, blood patching. The same uh, is true in this study, study published after our study in 2014, a uh, similar number of cases of accidental dural puncture, and again with intrathecal catheters, a reduction of post dural puncture headache from 54 to 37%. Uh, and another example published in 2016, uh, less, uh, post dural puncture headache with intrathecal catheters. These intrathecal catheters do not have many side effects uh, in this large series. No serious side effects could be identified. Uh, there was some failure of the, the spinal catheters for, for, for functioning as an anesthetic technique, but that was minor, two, three, four percent, basically. Um, what about a prophylactic epidural blood patch. You all know, and I will come to that later in my talk as well, if a patient has an established postural puncture headache, the treatment option, the primary treatment option is to, to give a blood patch, inject patient blood, autologous blood into the epidural space. Some have said, well, if we 
perforate the dura accidentally, we might, before we remove the epidural catheter, give a prophylactic blood patch before there is a headache upon removal of the epidural catheter. And you might then prevent posterior puncture headache to occur. And some studies have been uh, shown, uh, but the evidence is very minor, so not really very strong and no clear cut benefit of doing preventive uh, epidural blood patching. But then there was this study by Stein in 2014, where they did see a positive effect. It was a randomized and prospective client, uh, to, uh, trial, but it was not double blinded and there was no uh, sham epidural blood patch, so no blood patch performed, but without giving any blood. Um, and they saw indeed in this trial a decrease in incidence and severity. However, I have to say uh, this trial lacked a few, uh, I mean, there were some problems with this trial, for instance, that it was not double blind. Okay. What, when you have postural puncture headache, what can you do? And this, I think, is also very interesting for, for non-anesthesiologists. Bed rest, oral fluids, intravenous fluids, abdominal binders um, are, have all been suggested as um, conservative treatment options where you don't really need to intervene. And basically, there is no evidence whatsoever that it works. Uh, it might give you some, some short lasting effects, but it will not cure and solve the problem. What about pharmacological interventions? The administration of gabapentinoids, tryptane, steroids, ACTH, theophylines, caffeine. Caffeine is probably the, the best tested, but it also has serious side effects. Like in pregnant patients, it might induce um, uh, eclampsia or preeclampsia. Uh, opioid analgesia, simple oral analgesia, do they work? Again, I have to say insufficient evidence of efficacy. They do not really give reliable pain relief, long lasting pain relief. What about uh, some uh, interventions like the greater occipital nerve block or the sphalopalatine ganglion block? Um, here, there is some evidence that is out there that it might be a positive thing to, to study. The sphenopalatine uh, ganglion block is basically um, a, a cotton-tipped uh, applicator, like a, a COVID test, which you bring into the nose, uh, and you have soaked it into local anesthetic, and you try to block uh, the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion, um, uh, in both nostrils, and as a result, uh, headache will subside. And you leave this in for, for a prolonged period of time, a couple of hours sometimes, to see whether there is a positive effect. Most of the studies that have been published come from one uh, institution, and they saw a positive effect on, on headache. Again, if you have um, one, if you have studies coming all from the same institution, before you can say this is reliable evidence, somebody needs to confirm it from another institution. So uh, if anybody's interested in doing this prospective randomized controlled trial, uh, this would be extremely helpful to do. What about the injection of epidural drugs? Uh, things that we are normally not injecting epidurally, like dextrains, gelatines, fibrin glue, hydroxyethyl starch solutions, Unfortunately, again, I have to say no real evidence of efficacy uh, for any of these drugs. And all of these, these things have been extensively studied by the Obstetric Anesthetist Association Postural Puncture Headache Group um, that published their, their um, evaluation in December 2018. What about the epidural blood patch? The epidural blood patch is the standard of care at the moment. Uh, and there, there is this large uh, European trial that looked at the management practices of posterior puncture headache in obstetrics. Um, it was a, a prospective international cohort study where all patients developing accidental dural puncture and a headache were uh, assessed for several days and for months. 
and put into a database. And approximately a thousand patients were evaluated. Some of them received a blood patch and others did not. And what you can see is that 65% who developed a headache after an, an anesthetic obstetric intervention needed a blood patch. But one in three, no blood, blood patch was required and the, the problem went away after a couple of days. Uh, pain intensity was quite significant and um, uh, there were some indications that uh, a needle size was important, that intrathecal catheter uh, reduced the incidence of posterior puncture headache. So this, this uh, large uh, trial published in 2020 gave us some insight into uh, the, the, the problem uh, and, and the positive and negative things that we could do. Um, can you do, how often does a blood patch, is a, is a patient helped with one blood patch? Um, this is a large study by Booth uh, and co-workers from the United States uh, where they had uh, 750 patients. And what they noticed was that um, in uh, approximately 15% of patients, uh, a second blood patch was required. And in 1.5% uh, of patients, a third blood patch was required. So um, patients do need additional blood patches. When you do perform after posterior puncture headache, uh, a blood patch, it's probably best to do it from day two to day three after the onset of symptoms or after the procedure. So if you bring a patient after a lumbar puncture to the anesthetist, it is important that you don't expect the anesthetist to do the epidural blood patch at 24 or 12 hours after the procedure, but 48 to 72 hours, because then the, the success rate of the blood patch is higher. Um, what is the ideal volume of a blood patch? Um, a lot of discussion. It's certainly 15 mLs or higher, some say 20. There, is an in, there are some indications in some studies that probably it needs to go up to 25 milliliters. The higher the volume, the better. But it, in, in all of these studies, it doesn't reach statistical significance. Although I have to say that in the study by, um, sorry, doesn't move anymore, okay. By Peck and coworkers, um, they looked at specifically this issue or this problem, and what they noticed was that uh, the, uh, if you went up to 30 milliliters, the incidence of postural puncture headache was reduced, and there were more patients with permanent and complete pain relief. Um, so probably I would say if you give a blood patch, go as high as possible until the patient's senses uh, post uh, uh, back pain, because that's an annoying problem that can occur. Now I, I want to mention some long-term effects. Um, indeed, what is the prognosis of postural puncture headache? Well, one thing is that, and this was published last year in anesthesia, if you have postural puncture headache, the risk of persistent headache and low back pain is significantly increased. Uh, this is a large uh, group of uh, uh, people that studied this. Um, and uh, what they noticed that in patients who uh, developed a headache, there was more chances of, um, of uh, persistent headache and more chances of um, uh, of, of back pain. So you can see the, 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 the risk factors there, um, which I think is, a, is an, an, an important thing um, for us as physicians to know that even if you treat the patients, they, they still have a higher risk of uh, maintaining problems. And I don't think that was well recognized until five, six years ago. And this is uh, the looking at uh, um, back pain, same uh, thing, more risk of back pain in patients with posterior puncture headache. Um, and, and this is another way of uh, presenting this, um, also the severity of, post, of, of persistent headache and low back pain is higher in those patients. Um, 
so there are some indications that uh, indeed um, headaches as a result of posterior puncture headache might last longer than you expect. Another issue that I think has come to, to light in the last couple of years is that of uh, the association of an accidental dural puncture, a postural puncture headache, and an increased risk of subdural hematomas. These are two patients who had an accidental dural puncture for a labor epidural, and you can see in both of them a subdural hematoma developing on the two, second or third postoperative day. Um, small or large ones. Uh, my research fellow Kuipers uh, a couple of years ago looked into this and went through the literature and identified 56 reported cases of subdural hematoma intracranially as a result of accidental dural puncture and postural puncture headache and noticed all the associated symptoms that were uh, involved in this. And um, we also try to explain the pathophysiological mechanism of this uh, serious complication. When you do an accidental dural puncture, there is a CSF leak, cerebrospinal fluid pressure is reduced, and you have gravitational traction on brain structures. As a result of the traction, there might be subdural veins that rupture and a subdural hematoma can develop. Or you can have compensatory vasodilation, and you have a postural puncture headache that might develop. So as a result of the cerebrosinal fluid leak, the headache develops, but also the subdural hematoma develops. And we identified those cases, but two very large studies also underlined this significant problem. This is a study published in JAMA Neurology some two years ago by the group of uh, Jose Carvalho in Canada, and what they noticed was that in a group of 26, 22 million uh, patients that delivered a baby in uh, Canada, um, there were 340 women developing a subdural hematoma, and there were approximately 70,000 women developing postural puncture headache. Um, so 22 million deliveries, 70,000 postural puncture headaches and 342 uh, subdural hematomas. They noticed a 60% blood patch rate with 42,000 blood patches. But what is much more interesting and important is that, um, is that the risk of, post of subdural hematoma <coughs> in general, in the total population is 1.5 in 100,000. When in patients with post dural puncture headache, the risk of subdural hematoma is 145 in 100,000. So 200 times increased risk of uh, post dural puncture headache if you adjust for confounders. And if you delay the blood patch after two days, two to three days, the risk even further increases. Uh, so it is extremely important to manage the posterior puncture headache and treat with the blood patch as soon as possible, but not too early because then the positive effect is gone. And this study in the JAMA was um, uh, reinforced or confirmed by a study published in Anesthesia and Analgesia by the group of Ruth Landau in New York, where they looked at approximately 1 million women uh, that delivered in a 10-year in a, uh, period in New York, and they saw more serious neurologic complications in women with post puncture headache, three times more than in um, those that did not have a post puncture headache. Serious complications like thrombosis, subdural hematomas, etc. So if you have a patient with a history of a procedure involving the dura mater, and there is a headache that develops. Remember that if the, and the patient doesn't react to a blood patch and the symptoms reoccur, look at secondary symptoms, focal signs, and then go for an investigation to rule out serious neurologic complications like, like a subdural hematoma by doing an MRI, for instance. I would like to thank you for your attention.
Um, I would say that uh, in epidurals for labor, epidurals for surgery, spinal anesthesia holds a rate of 1% accidental dura punctures. And of those accidental dura punctures, 70% develop a headache after spinal anesthesia, 1% to 2%. In two out of three, you need to use the blood patch. And in one out of five of these blood patches, these patients will need a second blood patch. So a blood patch isn't always immediately uh, successful. Um, I've discussed timing and volume of the blood patch. I would suggest 20 to 30 milliliters as much as you can go until there is back pain. And I would suggest to do the blood patch two days after the puncture if a headache develops. However, we should wary, be aware of serious complications uh, that can occur like subdural hematoma, and the risk is increased after accidental dural puncture and after the development of post dural puncture headache. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Professor, for this detailed and high quality presentation. I also have uh, one or uh, two patients uh, with dural tear in the spinal operation uh, and developed. Uh, intracerebral hematoma, fatal intracerebral hematoma, but I didn't know that after drug puncture, it can be occur also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And we must be careful with that. Mm -hmm. And also after lumbar punctures, I think if patients develop a headache, indeed, it's very, I mean, if they then develop other neurologic symptoms, it, it would be uh, uh, safe to do a, an MRI and to see whether there is a subdural hematoma developing because, I mean, a, a lot of these patients, if you do a lumbar puncture uh, and, and if symptoms worsen afterwards, I think it's it's cautious to, to see whether, you, whether you've done something other than, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, to develop a subdural or epidural uh, hematoma, somewhat reasonable, but intracerebral hematoma developing? No, no, it's subdural, it's subdural. Yeah, subdural. Yeah. But in my case, it was inter, uh, intracerebral hematoma, but it was a big tear in the operation and then uh, yeah. the patient developed intracerebral hematoma and uh, eventually he died, yeah. unfortunately. Okay, I am looking at the chat section. Uh, there is one comment from Professor Khan Katerjolo. He is an anesthesiologist in Izmir. Thanks to the Professor Van de Velde, postural puncture headache is an important problem today for anesthesiologists. Well, what will we do? It's, it's not a question, actually. Maybe uh, you told a lot of things. Maybe Professor Khan Katerjolo want to talk himself. Uh, Khan, are you there? Maybe you can make some Yes, yes, comments. yes, yes. I am here. Okay. Would you like to say uh, something about uh, this subject? Thank you very much to Professor Van der Velde. Uh, today, Khan, our program... Sorry, we cannot see your face. Yes. The light is coming from your behind. Behind, can you make something? Yes. You look. There is a light <coughs> after me. Now you can you see? No. You are still black. All black. Okay. Now it's okay. Now okay. Uh, today our problem is not a. Uh, uh, accidental puncture uh, with epidural uh, needle. Our problem is uh, we use 27 gauge uh, spinal, spinal needle, Huinke. Then uh, we see uh, postural puncture headache uh, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, taker or pencil point needle uh, is not uh, is it difficult uh, to uh, perform with this needle? Uh, what we will do? We must find a solution uh, for 
postural puncture headache. Uh, despite we uh, use uh, 27 gauge uh, needle, Kuinke needle. Yeah. So what will we do? Well, I think first of all, um, if you, I, I would advise you to use the 27 gauge non-cutting Whitaker needles, for instance. Um, I, it's a little bit of a different technique. Uh, you need to advance it a millimeter further because the, the, the hole is not so close to the tip. But once you, you, you've done 20 or 25 of those, you will, you will know it. You will be able to perform it. If it's difficult to get the Whitaker needles, what you can do to reduce the incidence of, of uh, headache is before you remove the spinal needle, after you've done the spinal uh, injection, before you remove the needle, you reinsert the stylet into the, uh, the spinal needle and then you remove it. And I think you might be able to reduce your incidence of postural puncture headache then. That would be my advice. Can you repeat, please? Can I, I can't understand. Yeah, so when you, the best is to use the Whittaker needles, the non-cutting needles. Yes. And I know it's a little bit of a different technique because the hole in the spinal needle is not as close to the tip as with the Quinque. So you need to advance it half a millimeter to a millimeter deeper into the spinal space. But if you do not have the availability to use Whittaker needles, you can reduce with the Quinque needles the incidence once you've performed the spinal perforation of the dura, you, in, you remove the stylet, you inject your local anesthetic. Before yes. you take the spinal needle out, you reinsert the stylet into the spinal needle, and then you remove the spinal needle. Oh, uh, OK, OK. And that will help okay. because then you will not have tissue coming into the spinal needle. And when you remove the spinal needle, the tissue will be retracted and the, the hole will be larger. So that, that is one way of reducing the chance of having a headache. Thank you very much, Professor Van de Velde. It's new uh, for me for uh, this uh, consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Karan, for your comments and contributions. And Associated Professor Orat Özkalkan'da is with us. And uh, could you please some, make some comments? Uh, thank you, Professor. I am from uh, the same hospital in the uh, Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had a uh, postural puncture headache patient. Uh, uh, and the, the clinical uh, presence uh, was uh, about 20 days. Uh, after 20 days, the anesthesia is uh, the patient is consultated with uh, anesthesiology department, and the uh, CT scan of the brain is uh, revealed that the patient had a subdural uh, subdural uh, hematoma. Mm -hmm. uh, but this patient wasn't an obstetric patient, uh, nor she had the, uh, any risk factors for uh, PDPH. Uh, thank you for underlining uh, subdural hematoma complication. Yeah, I think it's it's always been underestimated. Also, I mean, we had two cases in a short period of time, and that's when when I said to our research fellow, let's go and look for the literature. Eh? And, and we found numerous cases, and that's the only ones that have been reported. So there are many more. And then came this study by, by the group of Carvalho, I think it's an underestimated problem and we need to be careful about it. Yeah, very valid comment. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question in the chat part. Bahar, what yes. is Balkan? When you have a ADB for an epidural to get labor analgesia, do you insert an intratecal catheter and proceed your labor analgesia? with an intratecal catheter, or what else do you do? No, we do that. Eh? So when we have an accidental dural puncture, our protocol is to insert the epidural catheter intratecally and use it for labor analgesia or for cesarean section. Uh, of course, you need to be careful. You need to label. You may, need to be sure that everybody knows it's an intratecal catheter and it's not a spinal catheter. Why do we do this? Because it gives you good analgesia. 
There is no risk of a second dural puncture because if you have to redo the epidural, you can have a second accidental dural puncture, of course. And it works very quickly. The patient is immediately pain-free with intrathecal anesthesia. Um, so that's what we do. And we leave the catheter in for 24 hours with a, a locked pump, giving just a little bit of saline after the patient has delivered and then remove the catheter. And we have then less postural puncture headache. Yeah, so we do that. But the most important thing is to make sure that everybody knows it's an intrathecal catheter and not an epidural catheter. So label the patient, label the pump, label the catheter, label the filter. So no accidental high dose injection of your local anesthetic can be injected into the uh, spinal space. Thank you, sir, so much. Uh, I cannot see any other question or comment in the chat part. Uh, Bahar uh, Kowaki says, thank you very much for your explanation. Thank you. And we will uh, end the lecture. And I, for information, uh, we will uh, upload the records of the lecture uh, to our uh, YouTube page sometime later, uh, generally one month later, we will upload this uh, lecture completely and anyone who wants to see the lecture your information listen to you again uh, he can open just open our youtube page okay thank you so much good evening thank you very much good evening bye bye, bye, -bye. See you next time. bye, -bye. nice to meet you bye